Well, can we turn back in our Bibles to uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, and as we seek the Lord's help to study some the passage that we read uh, there as we introduce this character, uh, Elijah, tonight. We can read again verse 1 of chapter 17. 1 Kings 17 verse 1, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead. The Bible is filled with uh, many wonderful uh, characters, but there are a handful that stand out from the crowd, and Elijah is one of these men. A man of supremely bold faith, who ministered during one of the darkest periods in the history of God's people, Israel. And if you're wondering why we're studying him, well, probably because he just keeps cropping up. He keeps sticking his head above the parapet as, as if to say, I'm here, you should think about me. Because... If you were here when we did a study in the book of James in the evenings, James uh, uses Elijah as his sermon illustration, an illustration of how an ordinary man who prays a prayer of faith can achieve great things. And then on Sunday mornings when we did our angel series in the run-up to Christmas and we studied the birth of John the Baptist, there was a link there to Elijah as well. We were told that John the Baptist would minister in the spirit and power of Elijah. And if you were here last Sunday, Andrew in the morning preached on who do men say that I am? Some say Elijah. And if you came back in the evening, he preached on Transfiguration Mount. And who was on Transfiguration Mount with Jesus but Elijah? So why is this man so important? What do we know about him? And what can we learn from him? Well, I'd like tonight just to begin a a look at his life, just to find out a bit more about this man and his great faith. A faith that was exercised amidst massively challenging circumstances. And here's a man who, who continued to take a stand for God and a stand against evil, Even when he himself believed he was the only servant of God left in Israel. God raised up this man, Elijah, just as he had done with Esther the queen for such a time as this. He was God's man for that period in his nation's history. He would be the voice of truth. He would speak for God at a time when pretty much God had been banished from public life in Israel. And you know, that situation is is not hugely unlike our own day, where people are turning their back on God, where there are numerous attempts to silence God, to remove any reference from God in public life. And people just want to pursue their own preferences. And so Elijah will show us what real faith is like when it is unleashed in a hostile environment. But you know, God's ways are are often beyond us. We touched on that this morning. Who can fathom what God does? And what we see God doing here is, is strange because Elijah bursts onto the scene, presents this message to Ahab, and then God just takes him out of the equation. For three and a half years, God silenced the prophet. He takes him away into isolation on his own. Why? Why isolation? Well, isolation is very often a preparation. Preparation for what? A preparation for his next great declaration. Elijah's coming back. We're going to hear some more from Elijah. But first of all, God had to prepare him for further service. 
So he takes them into isolation and preparation for a further declaration. I want to see four things tonight as we study the last section of, of, of 16 and into 17. So first of all, we'll, we'll consider dark days. Dark days, because that's what we find at the end of chapter 16. Extremely dark days in Israel. And then secondly, we'll see a daring defiance in verse 1 of chapter 17, where, where, where Elijah just appears on the scene and and, and is not afraid. He stands up to Ahab. He speaks to this evil king Ahab with daring defiance. Also from verse 1 of 17, though, we'll see thirdly, divine drought. Divine drought. And we'll, I want to just unpack a little. Why drought? Of all the judgments God could bring, why drought? There's divine drought. And then fourthly, just really touching on verses 2 to 7, we'll see desolate dependence. God takes this prophet into a desolate place where he has no option but to depend wholly on God. So these will be our four headings. Dark days, daring defiance, divine drought, and desolate dependence. Before that, though, I just want to take a couple of minutes to, to, to just place this in... in where this fits in, in, in the big picture of, of, of God and his people. In the big picture, picture of what we call salvation history. God's work among his people. Because I, I, I think I'm guilty of dipping into a book in the Bible and, and teaching a book of the Bible. But, but people go away saying, when, when exactly did this happen? And how does this tie in with everything else that, that, that we've learned from scripture? So God in the book of Genesis... He chose a people for himself. He told Abraham that, that his descendants would be blessed and would be a blessing to others. These descendants, of course, were the Hebrews, the Jews. And God gave his people various leaders. They had Moses to, to lead them out of Egypt and, and through the wilderness. And Moses died and they had Joshua. So that, that covers the first five books of the Bible. The books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then we have Joshua, the next leader, who takes them into the promised land. And then for a period, there's no as if one big name leader. There are numerous less well-known leaders in the period of the judges. So you read that in the book of Judges. God keeps raising up another and another person. He's always got a leader for his people. And then after the period of the judges comes the era of the kings. So that's where we're at here, the era of the kings. So he gave his people a king. First king was Saul. And then there was David. And then there was Solomon. We're looking at Solomon in the morning, some of his writings, some of his teachings. And we saw last time we looked at Solomon. Solomon was really worried about what happens after I'm gone. Who's going to take over and are they going to make a mess? And that's exactly what happened. When Solomon was gone, Rehoboam became king in his stead. King of Israel. Israel was the 12 tribes. But he lost most of them. Rehoboam couldn't keep people together. So, 10 tribes split from two. There was 10 tribes became the northern kingdom. And there was two tribes left became the southern kingdom. The twelve in the north, because there was more of them, were known as Israel. The two in the south were known as Judah. So you'll see uh, here in verse 29, it makes reference to the king of Judah, and then it makes reference to the king of Israel. So the kingdom split. God's people split. You have Israel in the north, the northern kingdom, and you have Judah in the south. Just two. Ten tribes in the north, two in the south. But in the south, Judah is where Jerusalem was, is where the temple was, is where the center of worship was. And the northern tribes, Israel, very, very quickly went off the rails. Very quickly turned away from God. A succession of bad kings led them into idolatry. And at this point, we're looking at when Elijah comes on the scene, they are, they are at a very low end. The king of Israel is Ahab. And Ahab was a disaster of a king. So that's the background. If you didn't follow it all, don't worry. But it's just to put you in the picture of where we're at. 
We're following God's people in the era of the kings, but there's now a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Elijah ministered to the northern kingdom, to Israel, the, the, the larger group, but the group that had most quickly gone away from the Lord. So we're looking at the fact then, first of all, that these are dark days from the end of chapter 16. And we get a flavour of what things are like just prior to Elijah appearing on the scene. Ahab is the king of Israel. Look at verses 30, 31. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. And then you can go on. He sets up an altar to Baal. He builds a temple to Baal and, and other idols as well. Ahab was a bad king. But Jezebel, his wife, was even worse. She was a fanatical promoter of idolatry. She was the one who was ensuring that Ahab was continually pushing the boundaries of, of what was acceptable in Israel. Jezebel was in charge. We read that in 1 Kings chapter 21. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. She's the instigator of much of what was going on here. And their behavior together, their behavior is bound to lead to God's judgment. You can see it coming in chapter 16, verse 33. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. There's the hint. He's provoking God to anger. So you can expect that there's something coming. Ahab and Jezebel would easily have picked up the prize for most ungodly king and queen ever. But it wasn't just them. Their behavior rubbed off on the whole nation. Remember, we're talking here about God's people. We're talking here about ten of the tribes of the, of the children of Israel. And yet they had, they had gone away from the Lord in, in huge measure. Just one more example of it. It's in verse 34 there. Uh, in Ahab's time, and you might not pick it up just by, by reading it, but verse 34 says, In Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. So this is not just a passing reference to a building program in Ahab's day. This is Jericho. You know about Jericho. Jericho was the first major city that the children of Israel conquered when they entered the promised land. It's the one that they, they walked around it seven days. And then on the seventh day they walked around it seven times and they blew their trumpets and the walls fell down. And God gave the city into their hands and they destroyed it as God had told them. But after that, God said through Joshua, and this is the reference to, in accordance with the word of Joshua. God said through Joshua, anyone who rebuilds Jericho is cursed. It's cursed. But in Ahab's day, nobody cared what God said. Nobody cared. And so Hiel says, yeah, I'll go build it. So Hiel goes and he's only just started building when his eldest son dies. You think that would be a, a little warning bell. But no, he carries on. And he's just about to finish it and his youngest son dies. And there we have the confirmation that that's why. In accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua. Whoever rebuilds Jericho is cursed. So that's just a hint. That's just a reminder of what kind of days these were. Nobody batted an eyelid at what God had said. They didn't care. They would do what they wanted. Let's just ignore God. So that's the first thing tonight. These were dark days in Israel. Secondly though, going into chapter 17 and verse 1. Daring defiance. 
Suddenly, without warning, the sky Elijah appears on the scene. We're told virtually nothing about him, except that he's from Tishbe in Gilead. And that doesn't really help because scholars don't even know where Tishbe was. And the only time it's mentioned in the Bible is in relation to this fellow, Elijah. There's no family history given. We're not told who his parents were. There's no past credentials. He just barges onto the stage of history. Although, we believe that he's there because the divine director has ordered his appearance on the stage at this point. His name does give us a little hint that there's some spiritual pedigree behind him. Elijah, uh, two words, well, three really, Ail, I, and Ja. Ail is a name for God. Ail, I is my God. And Ja, or Yah, is the name of God, Yahweh. So his name means my God is Yahweh. Or very often when we translate things, we put them back to front. It means the Lord is my God. And Elijah's going to live up to that name. The Lord is my God. Because here we are looking at one of the greatest characters in the Bible. He wasn't just a prophet. He was a preacher. He was a reformer. He was a miracle worker. He was a leader. And, and, and he keeps cropping up, not just in the Old Testament, but as I said already, in the New Testament as well. James presents him to us as an ordinary man. He says, Elijah was a man just like us. But he prayed that it wouldn't rain. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again. And it did rain. He's on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. There's a connection with him and John the Baptist. We're told that John the Baptist ministered in the spirit and power of Elijah. And the link between these two, Elijah and John the Baptist, is, is, is fascinating. Although it's, it's beyond my explanation, but it's fascinating because they're really alike. Elijah Elijah's a kind of crude character. Okay, just a little bit on. There we, we, we find out that he, he's eating. He's eating stuff that scavenger birds are bringing him, that the ravens bring him. Now, okay, he didn't have a choice, but that's still rough. That, that's crude. And, and his appearance wasn't very suave either. If you, if you go to Second um, Kings chapter 1, we've got a description of what he looked like. That he wore a garment of hair, and a leather belt. And if you're thinking that sounds familiar. It sounds familiar because that's what we're told about John the Baptist. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 7. We're told that John the Baptist wore camel's hair. And a leather belt. And he ate locusts. And wild honey. That's crude as well. So it's not just... True that John the Baptist ministered in the spirit and power of Elijah. But John the Baptist dressed the same as Elijah and had a similar kind of diet to Elijah as well. These things are intriguing. Whether we were meant to make anything of them or not, I can't say. But Elijah is an amazing character. Because Elijah never died. As we go through his life story, we find that God sent a taxi to take Elijah directly to heaven. Second Kings chapter 2, we read that Elijah and his successor, Elisha, are walking together. And a chariot of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. This man went straight to heaven. He never died. So clearly we're looking at a man of great significance when we study 
Elijah. But I call this point daring defiance because that's what we see as soon as he appears on the scene here in the narrative. He takes a stand against the evil Ahab and the idolatry in the land. He, he's coming to remind them that God is king. That God is king. Notice his first words. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. You know, God had been forgotten in Israel. People lived as if God no longer existed. People acted as if God were dead. And Elijah's first words, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. He lives. And then he says, whom I serve. The significance of these words is huge. Because to say you serve the Lord at that point in history was to sign your own death warrant. Because Jezebel was killing off all the Lord's prophets one after another. Cast your eye across to chapter 18, verse 4. Just across the page, chapter 18, verse 4. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets. Not just killing them. Killing them off. She wanted to rid the land of every single one of the Lord's prophets. So by Elijah coming on the scene and saying, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve. He was putting himself in the firing line. These words are words of daring defiance. You know, in many ways, the, the great reformers of the 16th century... Are, are, were acting in a way similar to, to how Elijah acted. Martin Luther in particular, John Calvin to some extent. John Knox, John Knox here in Scotland, he did the same. He stood up to the royal house of the day. He took a stand against Mary, Queen of Scots, at, at great risk to himself. These men were, were in a similar vein to what we see Elijah doing here. So he comes on the scene during, during dark days and he shows daring defiance of this ungodly regime of, of Ahab and Jezebel. And as I said already, remember, he, remember the courage here. He's taking this stand, although he believes he's the last man standing. He believes that there's not another faithful servant of God in the land but himself. Would that not silence you? Would that not cause you to hold your tongue? And yet Elijah doesn't. Elijah doesn't. He speaks in daring defiance. But let's not forget this. Despite his prowess, we'll see a reminder as we study his life that, he, that he's still a very human figure. Because there's a point where Elijah becomes downcast and depressed. And it reminds us that Elijah may be great, but he's not invincible. He's not invincible. No, no mere human being is. He had to learn, like each of us have to learn, to look to the Lord and not to circumstances. Because when we look at circumstances, it gets us down. But when we look to the Lord, it lifts us up. So that's the second point. There's daring defiance. Daring defiance. Dark days, daring defiance. <clears throat> also from verse 1, divine drought. Now looking at, at a wee bit more detail at the message Elijah had for Ahab and, and the great significance of it, which we could easily overlook. So Elijah, he begins by this reminder that, that God lives and that he serves God. And then he launches into his uh, long-term weather forecast. He says, there'll be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Why is this so significant? The reason this is significant was because Baal, their idol, was the god of rain. The god of rain. He was the god whom they looked to to, to water their crops so that they would have a harvest. And so this is a direct attack on their idol, on Baal. The extended drought is going to show that their idol is useless. 
as, as the streams dry up and as the, as the crops begin to wither, so Baal's reputation will wither with them. This is God asserting his authority as the sovereign Lord. I'm the one in charge. Now, Elijah, he says, there'll be no rain except at my word. But remember, he's already said that he is there serving the Lord. This, this, is, this is God's doing. This is divine right designed to clearly show who's on the throne. One commentator says that it would appear to these idolaters as if Baal's sprinkler system had been turned off. And that's God's doing. Divine drought. But it's not just, it's not just an, a, a, a direct attack on their idol. It is also to show his own people Israel that God always does what he said he'd do. And this is exactly what God had said he would do if they turned to idols. Deuteronomy 11. Be careful. Or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you. And he will shut the heavens so that it will not rain. And the ground will yield no produce. God had said, this is what will happen if you turn away from me. So this divine drought has a two-fold purpose. It is to bring judgment on Israel. For its idolatry. But it's also to show them that the idol that they put in place of God. Is totally useless. Divine drought. We've seen dark days. Daring defiance. Divine drought. Fourthly, finally. Desolate dependence. Just glancing over verses 2 to 6. Desolate dependence. <coughs> I doubt if they had sermon feedback back in Elijah's day, but if they did, this poor man preached his first sermon and then he wasn't allowed to preach again for three and a half years because God took him out of the equation. God sent him into hiding, we're told. Verse 2, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. He was going into hiding. Why? Well, he was going into hiding for the protection of his life, first of all. He, God took him to the back of beyond, where, where he wouldn't be found. Because as we go on, we find that, that, that Jezebel is looking for all the prophets of God to eradicate them. So God took him to a place where he would be safe. But that's just one purpose of taking him to this desolate place. There's another purpose, and that is that God was removing his messenger from the land. And that is one of the greatest judgments that God could bring on any land. To silence his prophets. To silence his mouthpiece. And that's what God is doing here to Israel. But there's another purpose as well, and that is that Elijah would learn to live by faith. In this desolate place, he had to live in complete dependence on God. And you know, desolate dependence would be a lonely experience. A lonely experience for this man, for any man. And yet through it, God would prepare him for service. And in scripture we see this repeatedly. This is the way God often prepares his people for service. Think about, think about Moses, for instance. Moses was, was, was brought up in, in, in a palace in Egypt. He had everything. And where did God take him? God took him to the back of the wilderness where he was looking after his father's, father-in-law's sheep for 40 years. Why? To prepare him for another 40 years looking after his father's flock, Israel, in a wilderness. That's how God prepared him. And he, he did the same with John the Baptist. He did the same, to a degree, with, with Paul, the apostle. And of course he did the same with Jesus. 
right at the very start of his ministry, 40 days and 40 nights, tempted of the devil in the desert. But for Elijah, when you think that Elijah, we're going to see, is he's a man of action. How hard was this? God took him to a place of inaction. He's going to be stuck in this desolate place with, with, with not a single human companion. That's not easy. His only companions were the ravens that brought him food morning and evening. It was a lonely existence. Maybe you, you, you know something of that experience. Even though you, you, you may be surrounded by people, there are times in life where, where you might feel you have nowhere to go and no one to turn to but God alone. And that can be a hard providence. And that can be a lonely existence. And yet God always intends it for our good. So that we grow to realize that we can trust him wholly. We can trust him completely. In, in, in the midst of the drought, Elijah had no choice but to rely on God's provision. He, he must have realized that at some point this, this brook is going to dry up because we've got this extended drought. He must have thought some days, I, I wonder if these ravens will come back. Will I get food tonight or not? And yet he learned here that God always provides. God always provides. It wasn't an easy existence. It wasn't a comfortable existence. I mean, imagine, imagine being fed by ravens. They're scavenger birds. When they brought you meat, you think, where did that come from? Most likely it came from a carcass of an animal that, that died because of the drought. But you know, this was not a time to start thinking about E. coli and cross-contamination. Because if he didn't eat it, he would die. He would die. And, of course, God had, God had said to him, this is what I'm going to do. Verse 4, before he took him there, you will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you. That's miraculous. God says, I ordered the ravens to feed you. Now, I'm saying it could have come from... God, of course, could bring him f the freshest of fresh meat every day if he wanted to. Elijah, do you know what Elijah learned during this period? <clears throat> he learned that he, he was not reliant on the ravens or on the brook. He was reliant on God. It was God who had promised to care for him. And yes, this was desolate dependence. And yes, this would have been a hard experience. But in it and through it, he learnt that God could be trusted. And that is a lesson that every one of his people must learn at some point in our lives. That our God can be trusted. Next time, God willing, we'll see how he coped when the brook dried up. May God bless to us these thoughts on his word. Let us pray. Lord, we, we thank you for the Bible. We uh, often read some of the experiences that your people went through and we think we would never be able to cope. And yet, Lord, as we look back over our lives, we see many situations that you brought us through that we thought we wouldn't cope with, and yet your grace was sufficient. Help us, Lord, to learn that great lesson that our God can be trusted even when nothing seems to make sense. Be with each one of us, we pray, and draw us closer to yourself and cleanse us from sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Gonna finish singing from Psalm 121 <clears throat> on page 416. <clears throat> Psalm 121.
page 416. I'm going to sing the whole of the psalm. The tune is Bays of Harris. I to the hills will lift mine eyes. From whence doth come mine aid? My safety cometh from the Lord, who heaven and earth have made. Thy foot he'll not let slide, nor will he slumber that thee keeps. Behold, he that keeps his deal, he slumbers not, nor sleeps. Let's stand and sing these verses of Psalm 1 2. of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.